Among the four gates to the Forbidden City, compared with the other three, the East Flowery Gate is distinctive. The gate has only eight rows of round-headed decorations, while the other three gates have nine rows. As small a difference as this may seem, somewhat more than 480 years ago, the seemingly slight variation led to trouble that shocked both the Imperial Court and the common people alike. In the third lunar month of 1521, Emperor Wu Zung of the Ming Dynasty died, leaving behind neither son nor brother. And so the Empress Dowager decided that the Prince of Hubei, Zhu Hotung, should succeed to the throne. But when Zhu Hotong was about to reach the gate of military virtue, on his way to take up the throne, he suddenly stopped. Why had Zhu Hotong halted just as he was about to ascend the throne? What had made him so hesitant? As custom dictated, Zhu Hotong was supposed to enter the Forbidden City through East Flowery Gate and then make his way to the Hall of Literary Glory, where he would be formally identified as the Crown Prince before succeeding to the throne. However, there were only eight rows of round-headed decorations on East Flowery Gate, and so it was considered inferior to Meridian Gate, the Gate of Divine Prowess, and West Flowery Gate. Moreover, East Flowery Gate was close to the Hall of Literary Glory, where the Crown Prince had lived, but the Emperor almost never passed by this area. Zhu Hotong rejected the request of the Ministry of Rights to enter the Forbidden City through East Flowery Gate, and insisted that he had come to ascend the throne and could not enter the palace as a crown prince. The Empress Dowager worked on a compromise, reminding officials that the throne could not be left vacant for long, and that all the officials should leave the city and somehow persuade Zhu Hotong to enter the palace. At noon on the 28th day of the fourth lunar month, Zhu Hontong entered the imperial palace through the gate of Great Ming and stepped onto the imperial path before ascending the throne. Jia Jing became the title of his reign. In this dispute, the ministers had dared to contend with the man on his way to the throne, while at the same time, Zhu Hontong had adhered to his own opinion running the risk of losing the throne in the process. But had the ministers really taken the stance simply for the sake of a ritual? Was there some secret behind the ritual? And if so, what? It was 1661, the seventh day of the first lunar month in the 18th year of the reign of Shunju, and the 24-year-old emperor had died. In his last testament, he had written that his eight-year-old son Xuan Yu should succeed to the throne. Two days later, Xuan Yu was enthroned during a grand ceremony of enthronement, the most important ceremony in the Forbidden City, and one that took place on only 20 occasions over a period of 500 years. At the time Emperor Shunju was enthroned, the Ming Dynasty had only recently come to an end, and many parts of the Forbidden City were still in ruins. For this reason, the ceremony was held at the Gate of Supreme Harmony, and not in the Hall of Supreme Harmony as tradition called for. When Xuan Yu ascended the throne, the country was stable and it was possible to hold a regular ceremony of enthronement. But the protocol officials had to make arrangements for the procedure of the ceremony, the Imperial Guard of Honor, and the positions to be allocated to those attending the ceremony. Details of such a ceremony could be found in the archives of past dynasties. In the case of a change of dynasty, 
the major procedures in the ceremony would remain almost the same with the exception of garments. For protocol officials of the Qin dynasty, laws and regulations of the Ming dynasty served as the best reference standard, and today when we try to recreate a ceremony of enthronement as held during the Qing dynasty, we can find important clues and laws and regulations of the Qing dynasty. Before the enthronement, the emperor himself or officials he appointed would go to the Temple of Heaven, the Altar of Earth, the Imperial Ancestral Temple, and the Altar of Land and Grain to report to Heaven, Earth, and the Imperial Ancestors. On the day of enthronement itself, imperial guards would be found standing at every gate of the Forbidden City. Before daybreak, princes and ministers would be busy putting on their court dress before entering the Forbidden City. An imperial carriage, two imperial music orchestras, banners and flags, canopies and a guard of honor were scattered around the gate of Supreme Harmony and the Hall of Supreme Harmony. All the doors in the Hall of Supreme Harmony were opened. The Secretary of the Grand Council and officials from the Ministry of Rights entered the hall and placed the Imperial Edict of Enthronement, congratulatory notes, and writing tools on tables. The most special of these was the Imperial Jade Seal, which was placed on a table to the south of the throne. And so, eight-year-old Chuan Yu, in a white morning dress, knelt three times with his head touching the ground nine times before his father's memorial tablet. Next, he put on a ceremonial garment before making his way to the palace of the Empress Dowager, where he greeted her in a most solemn manner. The curtain over the middle gate of the Palace of Heavenly Purity was pulled down and this indicated that the funeral ceremony for the deceased emperor was now suspended. At daybreak, the emperor went out of the left side of the gate of heavenly purity for the Hall of Central Harmony where he sat on the throne. Officials directing the ceremony greeted the emperor in the most solemn manner, but then after this, they would no longer have to follow ritual and could concentrate on their duties. Xuan Yu sat on the throne in the Hall of Supreme Harmony and remained as emperor for the next 61 years. Today, it is rather difficult to recreate the Forbidden City's most important ceremony. None of the court paintings include this subject. Under the guidance of experts, however, we can get a fairly good idea from paintings of other ceremonies preserved in the Palace Museum in order to recreate some feeling of the enthronement of an emperor.
The enthronement was solemn but quiet, as the funeral of the deceased emperor was still underway, and so although the instruments of imperial music were on display, they were not played. But when these instruments were played, it was certainly for a very important ceremony in the Forbidden City. Every year, three highly important ceremonies took place in the Forbidden City. On the first day of the first lunar month each year, princes, ministers, and foreign envoys would come to pay tribute to the emperor. The rituals were similar to the grand ceremony of enthronement, but the atmosphere was more festive. The Emperor's birthday was a national festival for which the capital's craftsmen decorated the main streets with colored paintings, bright cloth, and other decorations. Everywhere, people would be seen singing and dancing to extol the good times, and throughout the country, civil and military officials exercised great courtesy in the direction of the capital. The winter's solstice was the time set aside for another great festival in the Forbidden City. On this day, sunlight could reach the innermost parts of the Hall of Supreme Harmony. On the winter solstice of 2004, special techniques were used to videotape this most rare event seen in the Hall just once a year. On this day, sunlight was reflected onto the horizontal inscribed board in the center of the Hall. The norms concerning rituals in China can be traced back to the Zhou dynasty about 3,000 years ago. In Duties of the Minister of Rites, a section of The Ritual of Zhou, rites were divided into five categories and applied to both the Son of Heaven and the common people. The buildings in the Forbidden City were used to standardize the norms of ritual. It is perhaps not difficult to imagine how a foreign envoy would have felt as he crossed Tiananmen Square, past the gateway of the Tiananmen Tower and then stepped onto the passageway in front of Meridian Gate before entering the Forbidden City to attend the grand ceremony for the first time. After entering the Forbidden City through a side gateway of Meridian Gate, he would have passed the Gate of Supreme Harmony from where he would have seen a very broad square with the awe-inspiring Hall of Supreme Harmony at the other end of the square. Passing Meridian Gate along the Imperial Path was a privilege of the Emperor and of the Empress only on the day she was married to the Emperor. However, this rule was broken at an interval of every few years.
The third lunar month on spring was the season in which good wishes were expressed, and it was also at this time that some scholars, having passed all the levels of the relevant examinations, would be able to fulfill their lifelong wishes of entering the Forbidden City. The palace examination, held once every three years, was the final imperial examination in ancient China. All candidates qualified for the examination in the Forbidden City had already obtained the title Past Scholars, those who had passed the Metropolitan Examination. When they attended the palace examination, they felt greatly honored as disciples of the Emperor. This is a palace examination paper from the Qianlong period. The examinee completed his essay, which had a title specified by the emperor, and the paper was then handed to him before sunset, as was the requirement. The top of the paper provides details of the examinee's name, age, native place, father's name, grandfather's name, his status, and his records of civil examinations. A palace examination grading official selected the ten best papers and submitted these to the emperor for his final decision. The palace examinations held during the Ming and Qing dynasties before 1790 took place on the square in front of the Hall of Supreme Harmony, but during the Qianlong period the same examinations were held in this hall to show the emperor's care for the candidates. The final result of the palace examination was made public, five days after it was held. In the number one historical archives, we found this list of successful candidates. In the last palace examination in Chinese history, attended by 273 examinees in 1904. The names of famous figures, such as Ten Yenkai and Shen Juen Ru, were on the list, and out of all of them, Liu Chunlin came out top in the examination. The announcement of the list of successful candidates in the palace examination was an important ceremony held in the Forbidden City. Miao Tung, who came first in the palace examination in the sixth year of the Kanchi period, described the scene in his diary. It was a bit cold that day. Before dawn, I, along with other successful candidates, knelt on the ground in front of the Hall of Supreme Harmony. On the previous day, I had heard rumors about the names of the top three successful candidates. I thought my prospects were hopeless. When the list of successful candidates was announced, I heard I was the top one. A protocol official dragged me out of the line, then I, along with the two other top successful candidates, followed the protocol official out of the palace through the middle gateway of Meridian Gate. The three lucky scholars took the passageway that was for the exclusive use of the Emperor and Empress and left the Forbidden City through the middle gateway of Meridian Gate. This was certainly the walk dreamed of by scholars in ancient China. At the same time as scholars were going through the trial of the palace examination, Chinese farmers were experiencing the busiest season of the year. This series of paintings, 
depicts farmers toiling in different seasons, but while the middle-aged man portrayed in each of the paintings may look like an ordinary farmer, he was in fact Ying Jin, the fourth son of Emperor Kan Chi, and his wife and children were even portrayed in the painting Farming and Weaving. It was well known to everybody that Emperor Kan Chi attached great importance to farming and sericulture. Undoubtedly, he was very happy to see this series of paintings. Ying Jin was so adept at scheming that he defeated his rivals for the throne and became Emperor Yung Jun. But like his father, Emperor Kan Chi, he also cared about agriculture. From the notes of Emperor Yung Jun's daily life, we find that he worked as a farmer for one day every year. In the middle of the second lunar month of the sixth year of the Yung Jun period, farmers all over the country would be about to start their farming season. And so, on the 18th day of the month, a great many people came to the altar of the God of Agriculture, where over 100 hectares of land had been opened up to the southeast of the altar. After offering sacrifices to the altar, the emperor would till a piece of land to set an example for farmers across the country. He put one hand to the plow and carried a whip in the other hand. As required by the ritual, the emperor should push the plow three times, but Emperor Yung Jung pushed it once more. It was believed that the rise and fall of this agricultural country depended on the grace of heaven, and so because he claimed to be the son of heaven, the emperor needed to receive the grace of heaven. The downside of this was that if heaven did not play along and trouble resulted, the emperor should be the first to be punished. The emperor was duty-bound to enter into a dialogue with heaven through sacrificial activities. The emperors attached the utmost importance to these sacrificial activities and observed stringent rules pertaining to their ceremonial garments. Sacrificial rites in the Imperial Palace were divided into 80 types and three categories, major rites, medium rites, and group rites. Major rites were performed by the Emperor himself, medium rites were observed partly by the Emperor, but mostly by his ministers, and group rites were attended entirely by officials. After the Manchu ruler from outside Shanghai Guan Pass became the new master of the Forbidden City, he introduced a new sacrificial activity. Sacrifices were frequently offered to deities in the Palace of Earthly Tranquility, but the new master of the Forbidden City turned the sleeping palace of the Empress of the previous dynasty into a site for offering sacrifices to deities.
A portrait of Lord Guan, also known as the God of War, can still be seen in the Palace of Earthly Tranquility. Offices and men of the Eight Banners regarded him as their patron saint and offered sacrifices to him before every battle. The ceremony of offering sacrifices to deities of the Manchu and Mongol ethnic groups used to begin at 4 p.m. and lasted for the entire night. This was a ceremony that had been handed down from primitive shamanism by the ancestors of the Qing imperial family. During the Qing Dynasty, tolls for making cakes were placed in front of a small room in the northeastern corner of the Palace of Earthly Tranquility. In this small room, three cauldrons stood on a kitchen range, and before each ceremony a pig was slaughtered and cooked in clear water before being offered to the deities. After the ceremony, the emperor would share the pork with princes and ministers. As required by the ritual, the pork was not seasoned in any way, resulting in a taste that was disappointing. So to remedy this, some of the princes and ministers hid salt in their long sleeves to sprinkle on the flavorless pork. Emperors of all the dynasties in ancient China worshipped heaven, their ancestors, and all things on earth. But more importantly, they prayed for their perpetual rule of the country. However, their prayers could not guarantee eternity to their dynasties. At a time when the Ming Dynasty was tottering due to natural disasters and the chaos of war, a new force was emerging in the area between the Changbai Mountains and the Heilongjiang River in northeast China. New Ar Herjur and his Eight Banners Army subjugated the Ming Empire. But when his grandson took the throne in the Forbidden City, he was faced with a mature civilization of considerable force. Shortly afterwards, the new master of the Forbidden City found himself blending as one with the civilization that had a long history of tradition. The rites that had been followed for thousands of years served as pillars of the new Qin Dynasty and the decrees, regulations it promulgated were able to be as complete and integrate as those of the previous dynasties. Ceremonies held in the Forbidden City in the past, however, had never been as solemn and as impressive as those of the new Qin Dynasty. In 1793, when Emperor Qianlong began the 58th year of his reign, in what was truly the flourishing age of the Qin Dynasty, he was so pleased with his achievements that he referred to himself as an old man perfect in every way, and preparations were being made for his 83rd birthday celebrations. The Longevity Festival was one of the three major festivals of the country, and even envoys from other Asian and European countries came to extend congratulations to the Chinese emperor. But this time, 
a group of foreign guests were to challenge the norms of etiquette that had been followed in China for thousands of years. In the summer of 1793, a fleet from Britain sailed into Dinghai Harbor in the Joshin Archipelago, a diplomatic mission led by George McCartney, a special envoy of King George III, had come to China in the name of extending congratulations on Emperor Chen Long's birthday. In their diaries, members of the British mission wrote about their first impressions of China. These paintings, executed by W. Alexander, an artist accompanying the mission, captured these scenes of China of 1793. The highest tower sets only two stories, and the roofs are marked by beautiful curves, but no facilities were installed to guard against wild animals and thieves and robbers, it must be safe in this country. Everywhere people are surprisingly busy. There are no idlers in China and not a single beggar can be seen. Thousands of poor people carried on their shoulders things that cannot be carried by vehicles. Since their childhood, the Chinese have been taught to be amicable and polite. The old live with the young in the same family. Every family keeps a family tree, and the ancestors' examples are often cited. Members of the same clan pay respects to their ancestors' terms at least once a year, and they visit each other from time to time. The uncle tells the nephew not to be too courteous among family members. The British, however, were puzzled by a custom that was very common in China at the time. Chief British Envoy George McCartney wrote, A Chinese navigator and some of his compatriots boarded the ship to help us. Curiously, they visited all the facilities on the ship. They knelt down as soon as they saw the emperor's portrait in the reception room and respectfully kowtowed over and over again. The portrait had been brought back to Britain by a merchant over twenty years before. It was very interesting that a doctor who had been to China told me that an ambassador had to kneel down three times and kowtow nine times in front of the Chinese emperor. I would not do so for the sake of Britain's honor. The British were prepared to go down on both knees, only in front of God and they could not understand what the kowtow meant in Chinese rites. Emperor Qian Long was unhappy when he learned that the members of the British mission would be refusing to kneel down in front of him. He ordered a minister to teach the British how to kowtow. Every foreign diplomatic envoy to China was required to learn to kowtow, but this new envoy was not to be an obedient student. Instead, he had come from Britain, a place that claimed to be the overlord of the world. George McCartney had brought with him products representing the most sophisticated science and technology in Britain, and he hoped that the Chinese would not only be interested, but also buy huge quantities of these products. He believed wrongly that the dispute over rights was unimportant.
Emperor Qian Long drew the following conclusion. They know nothing about protocol. The ignorant foreigners do not deserve a courteous reception. The articles of tribute from Britain shall be accepted since they have been delivered from afar with sincerity. But in fact, my celestial empire boasts all sorts of things, so it is unnecessary to buy goods from that country. George McCartney had failed to open up the market in China he had hoped for. He had instead spent all his time totally occupied with matters of protocol and never once got the chance to speak of the goal of his journey. The gifts from Britain were placed in the Imperial Gardens where, dozens of years later, they were found by the British-French Allied forces when they occupied Yuan Ming Yuan Garden. All the cannons, guns, shells, and bullets had remained intact the Chinese having never shown any interest in touching them. In early February, 1796, on the eve of Chinese New Year, Emperor Qianlong received another letter from King George III of Britain, who hoped to expand a trade relations between the two countries. But yet again, Emperor Qianlong turned down the request. Instead, he signed his last edict as emperor. On the next day, he would abdicate in favor of one of his sons to fulfill the promise he had made upon his enthronement 60 years before. On September the 3rd, 1735, ten days after the death of Emperor Yung Zheng, Emperor Qianlong had succeeded to the throne. At the time, he took an oath in front of the memorial tablets of his ancestors. Among the previous emperors, Kan Shi reigned for 61 years. If I have the same opportunity under the care of heaven, I won't dare to suppress my ancestor, and I will abdicate in favor of my son after I have reigned for 60 years. Now the need to fulfill his oath was becoming a reality. On the eve of his abdication, Emperor Qianlong composed a poem to express his multitude of feelings. Some of the lines are as follows. Today is the last day of the reign of Qianlong, and tomorrow will be the beginning of the reign of Jia Qing. I am lucky enough to have reigned for 60 years. When he abdicated in 1796, Emperor Qianlong had every reason to be proud of himself. He said, The state policy of giving first priority to farming and sericulture has made one-third of the world's population self-sufficient, and both the imperial family and the common people scrupulously abide by their duties. Isn't this the prosperous age the Chinese have dreamed of for so many centuries? I would like to ask if there was any country more stable and rational than China. Is there any force in the world that can be on an equal footing with me? In early 1796, on Lunar New Year's Day, a grand ceremony was held in the Forbidden City, in which Jian Long abdicated in favor of Jia Qing. Jian Long said at the time that it was a great event, unprecedented through the ages.
At the time the Masters of the Forbidden City were celebrating that great event, George McCartney, who had returned to Europe three years before, smashed the image of the Chinese Empire that had been cherished by Westerners for centuries. He said, The Chinese Empire is only an old, worn-out ship, but fortunately some cautious captains have protected it from sinking in nearly 150 years. The gigantic hull scares its neighboring countries. If it good for nothing serves as the steersman, discipline and safety will be out of the question on the ship. It would not sink immediately. Like a wreck, it will drift everywhere until it is dashed to pieces against the coast. While people on China's side of the globe had created the myth of governing a country by rights, on the other side of the globe, this myth had already been perceived as a bubble that might burst at any moment. The age of grand ceremonies in the Forbidden City was coming to an end.